remain standing as we read God's Word together. We've been working our way through the Ten Commandments, and we come to the last one, right? So if you've been here with us the last couple weeks, you know what we're going to do. I'm going to read, and then when we come to today's commandment, we'll read it together as a family. So, Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of of slavery. He shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And on it you shall not do any work, you or your servant, or for you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. All good things come to an end, don't they? <laughs> and today we come to the end of our study in the Ten Commandments, and of course the last sermon's got to be on the Tenth Commandment, right? The Tenth and the final one, and if that really depresses you, let me give you some good news. In the fall, we're going to come back with Exodus 21 onward, the fun laws, so you can be looking forward for that, right? But in the meantime, let's consider the Tenth Commandment together. And friends, it's a tough one. Because the Tenth Commandment, do not covet, really is the commandment underneath all the other commandments. It is, in fact, the one that we break with every single other one in the list. In fact, the Bible tells us explicitly that, that covetousness is a form of idolatry. Let me show you this. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5 says this. Be may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God, of Christ, and God. That's pretty intense, right? And we get it repeated. Colossians chapter 3 says this. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Covetousness is at its root the worship of stuff over the worship of God. And the Tenth Commandment is a sharp sword that pierces everybody's heart and exposes all of our sin. The Tenth Commandment is the law we break. All of us break because it's the law of the heart. It's a law regarding our affection and our desire. The Ten Commandment confronts us with the reality of our envy, our greed, a sense of us getting what we think we deserve, and a feeling that we think we know better than God. And it confronts our desires. Now, I'm sure if you've been in church long, you know that I think the church cannot, often doesn't teach very well about the issue of desire. Right. We often want people to think that all desire is wrong. Just be a robot. Be stoic. Feel nothing and enjoy it. Right? But that isn't how desire works at all. The Bible actually says desire is good if it's put in the right 
place. Right? The Bible tells us that God gave us a desire for food, so we should eat. Right? The Bible talks about that a desire for marriage and even sexual desire is good in the covenant context that God gave it. The Bible even tells us that we should desire good for others. 1 Timothy chapter 3 uses the word covet, saying if someone should desire to be an elder, to be a leader in the church, they need to covet it. They need to have a strong desire for it. So, not all desires are bad. God doesn't call us to live some sort of stoic life without desires. But rather, God calls us to have a life of God-defined and God-centered desires. That's what the Tenth Commandment is really all about. And the commandment about coveting is not a commandment forbidding all desire, but a specific kind of desire. Let's define coveting before we dive in together. Here's what it means to covet. And there's a two-part definition here. To desire what someone else has or what we shouldn't. Have. But again, there's a two-part definition, right? To desire what someone else has or what we shouldn't have. On the back part of the definition, I think we get it, right? We shouldn't desire things that God forbids or condemns. But it also includes on the first part a desire, a strong desire to have what someone else has, to envy, to have a heart of greed, to look with longing at what someone else has. The Ten Commandments warns us, yes, don't have a desire for the wrong thing, but also don't have a desire for a good thing in the wrong way. And I know as I hear this, I can't be the only one here that when I start hearing having to discern, well, I'm wanting it for the right reason. I can really get all introspective sometimes, right? I start thinking, well, am I desiring that because I really want it or because I'm coveting it? Or, or am I, not, I, I just really can get in my head and struggle to think to myself, am I, am I just, is this a good desire or a sinful desire? And I can begin to get confused. I can try to discern my desires and it can lead me to uncertainty and to confusion and to despair. It can lead me to declare what the prophet Jeremiah declares in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitfully wicked and sick above all things. Who can understand it? There's times I go, I don't even know what I want and if it's really a good thing for me to have. I don't know if anybody else has been there or if this is just me here, right? I have to start with the reality that I don't even sometimes know my own heart. And that, friends, despite what the Disney movies tell you, following your own heart often will get you into all sorts of trouble and confusion and uncertainty. But thankfully, there is one who understands our heart, and he offers us guidance as to how we can know it and discern our desires. Jeremiah 17, 10, the very next verse, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. God knows our hearts, and his word is able to test us and help us to search our desires. And so I think as we think about coveting, God's word is helping us here to think about our own hearts, to discern our desires. We understand what it means to desire something God forbids. As every single command we've gone down through, the command to murder also includes the desire for someone to be murdered, right? Or a hatred in our hearts. The commandment against adultery includes lustful desires. But it can be really hard to know, am I wanting this that somebody else has? What, how am I discerning all of this? And so I want us to ask five questions to discern our desires. Hope these will kind of be a grid for us as we think, well, am I coveting this or do I simply want this? Let's start with the first question. Ask yourself this. Would you trade places in order to have it? That's the first question to ask. Would you trade places in order to have it? It's really one of the core differences between just wanting something, having an Amazon wish list, and actually wanting to have something your neighbor has. Look back at Exodus 20, verse 17, and notice 
there's something that appears over and over and over and over again. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Notice the problem isn't wanting a house. It's really, really wanting the house your neighbor's got. Right? It's something that belongs to your neighbor. It's to say to myself, if I had everything they had, I would be happy. Have we ever looked at someone else and thought, man, man, if I had their life, their spouse, their kids, their job, their, their pay, all of these things, then I'd have it all. Friends, that's when we begin to step over from desire into coveting. Friends, we probably aren't tempted to, to, to covet our, our neighbor's male or female servants because none of us have those, right? But have you ever desired somebody's job? And not simply a desire to have a different job, because that's not a bad thing, but to take the role from another. It's, this isn't about setting a goal to move up in management, but it's thinking that, man, if I just got to this point, and I could take that away from that guy, then I've arrived, right? It's thinking you could have satisfaction in the role in the place of your neighbor. He also says, don't covet your neighbor's livestock. And now, I don't know if that's really a temptation for most of us, though you shouldn't be coveting your neighbor's cow, right? Or even the cow they got out on a barbecue later on today, right? But have you ever sought to covet somebody's cars? Maybe we want the house they have. Maybe we covet the ability of the family next door to go on a big vacation every year. If you desire to walk in the shoes of another without actually doing the work that that person did, friends, then your desire has stepped from want over into covetousness. If we would rather sit and look at how green the yard is next door rather than mow our own yard, <laughs> we've stepped over to covetousness. And here's the point. By desiring to trade places with someone else, we're saying, God, you made a mistake as to where you put me and where you put him. You should have put me where you put him and put him where you put me, right? And I know one of the temptations for me, and I'm going to speak this particularly to the young people. I know in this season of my life, I'm tempted in my 20s to really covet what people have in their 40s or 50s, but I've not put in that extra 20 years of work that they did, right? And so we can't think that we can trade places with another, particularly with another, who's years of harvesting ahead of us. To trade places with someone else is ultimately to think we know better what our life needs than the creator and sustainer of all things. It puts us in the place of God. This is why covetousness is idolatry. And I think I realize this. The grass may look greener on the other side, but it's really not, is it? The house may look great, but they probably live under crippling debt. You may think they're, that, that their spouse is amazing, yet their marriage is in shambles. The job, the pay, the benefits, all of it seems great until you realize that they're a workaholic, that they live under crippling stress, and they never get any time with their family. You may think you want to be someone else or have someone at what someone else has until you do. Be careful what you ask for. And be mindful, it isn't wrong to want things. But don't begin to see yourself trading places with another because that creates envy. And to envy is to covet. So that's the first question. Do you, do you trade places in order to have it? Here's the second question question to ask. Do you want it in order to impress people with it? Do you want it in order to impress other people? Friends, are you wanting to simply keep up with the Joneses, right, or whoever your neighbors may be? Do you want it so that your neighbor will give that look while you drive it up into the driveway? Y'all know the look. You want that. Did we get the new car, the fancy pool, so that the neighbors would go, I want to be that guy? Underneath that is a dangerous desire. We are not to live for the applause of the world. 
Because if we live with the applause of the world, hear me, the world is all you will get. If you live for the cares of the world, you will miss out on what we ought to care the most about. In fact, Jesus tells this parable about a farmer who spreads seed. And he tells us the seed stood for the word of God, and the seed landed on various soils. And each soil is sort of a way that people respond to receiving the word of God. And he speaks about seed that's sown among thorns. And he says this, As for the seed sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Right, say that riches are deceitful. And if, and if you get really rich and you get a bunch of friends, let me tell you, they're only there for one thing, and it's for you to buy dinner. Right? And the friends it brings and the welcome that it brings, friends, are not lasting. Friends, it just makes you an unfruitful tree with a bunch of stuff. And the Apostle John actually warns us about this. He says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, and whoever does the will of God abides forever. Our desires for the world's applause... The longing of our eyes, the pride of life, it's opposed to God. Here, a warning here. You cannot stay friends with the world and remain a friend of God. Jesus would warn us, actually, that the world will hate you because it hated him first. Remember, we're living in Holy Week, and everybody thinks, man, if I just love people the way Jesus did, everybody will love me. Remember, Jesus loved everybody the way Jesus did, and they killed him. Friends, hear the warning. If we love the world, the world is passing away. But it's the one who does the will of God who abides forever. If you desire to impress others, to have their attention and welcome, you will not live as a faithful follower of Jesus. You cannot live following God if you're always seeking to please man. And their acceptance is fleeting anyway. And that's what the Tenth Commandment reminds us of. It's telling us to live for what lasts forever. Not what will be gone quickly or gone in a quick disaster. We need to ask ourselves, would we trade places in order to have it? Do we want it in order to impress people with it? Third, ask yourself this, has getting it become your life's purpose? Whatever it is, whatever you're desiring, has that just become the driving force of your life? Well, I would do anything to have it. Do you actually mean it? Because Jesus warned about the deceitfulness of riches, and we are tempted to build our life, our identity, our worth, everything around what we have, right? We're very tempted in our world to do that. And Jesus teaches us and warns us about this as he's responding to a man who was consumed with greed. Let me show you this in Luke chapter 12. Look at this. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Well, I love this. This man comes up and goes, Jesus, I need you to be the attorney and show him that, that this inheritance here that's in this will is supposed to be divided up against all of us. Can you imagine? This man wants Jesus to settle this big family dispute. Sometimes the ugliest things can happen in handling an inheritance, right? Especially when it's the, the rock in the family that was in the middle of it all. And look what Jesus says to the man. I love this. And he says it with the crowd listening in. He says, next, man, who made me a judge and an arbiter over you? Jesus is going, I'm not getting in your family drama. <laughs> I'm not getting involved in this. And then he says this. And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. In other words, your purpose in life isn't just to collect stuff. 
It isn't to gather more and more and more. Your whole legacy isn't meant to be erased with a yarn sale. And I'm afraid there's many of us, our everything we are would be gone with one yard sale. I'm afraid that while we, we say, I know I can't take it with me, we live like we can. And I'm reaching to myself because the Bible says that an inheritance is a righteous thing, but still warns us about the danger of hoarding wealth. Let me show you this. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. So there's a balance to be struck here right, when it comes to wealth and possessions, because it, the Bible actually never says that money is the root of all evil. People who, who tell you that have never read the whole verse, right? The verse says the love of money is the root of all evil. Because if money was a problem, then a good man leaving an inheritance to his grandchildren would be a bad man, right? But it does warn us about building our lives around our bank accounts. An inheritance can be a good thing if it's managed well, but regardless of how you live, him and rich, poor, most of us are likely somewhere in between, friends, when you die, your bank account's getting closed, your house is going to become someone else's, your car is probably getting sold, and your money is being spent by someone who didn't earn it. You never feel frustrated about that? Does that make you a little upset? Because here's, here's what King Solomon I had to say, King Solomon was very rich and very powerful. He had a lot of stuff to give away to other people. And he says this, So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who's toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. In other words, Solomon's saying, I could leave all my wealth to this person and they could squander it. They could use it for, for wild stuff. Your house is probably going to be demolished one day. Your name and legacy forgotten. And this is why we don't put our hope in riches or in stuff. Your purpose cannot be found there. Life doesn't exist in the abundance of possessions. And we step from desire into covetousness when we begin to build our purpose around getting it and getting more and more and more. Let's ask the fourth question. And this is so important. Here's the fourth question in discerning, am I wanting it? Am I coveting it? Ask this, are you prepared to go to war? Are you prepared to go to war for it? If you're willing to have conflict for it, you're likely coveting it. Friends, let me say this. Most wars in the history of the world are fought over a couple simple things. Money, power, or resources. Right? And this isn't just true on a geopolitical level. It's true on your interpersonal relationships as well. Whether the battlefield's on the countryside or on your home in the countryside, greed and envy produces all kinds of fights and battles in our lives. The book of James puts, puts it this way. I love this. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. See it. Greed works its way into fights and quarreling. Remember, the tenth commandment is the commandment underneath which all the other ones are broken. It even tells us here that greed and envy are the dark underbelly of the sixth commandment, to not murder. Somebody wants something or didn't get something, so they murdered, right? It's the dark underbelly of the seventh commandment. Man, I'd love to have their spouse, so they commit adultery. It's the underbelly of the eighth and the ninth commandment, to steal and to lie. Friends, warfare begins with wrong wants. Warfare begins with wrong ones. The love of stuff causes so much strife. This is true in every area of our lives and families and organizations. And, and don't assume me here. There are noble things to go to war for. There are things in your life worth fighting for. There are things in your life worth protecting and fighting for. But 
Friends, there's certain stuff that just isn't. Anything that you bought for Christmas or will buy for Christmas is not worth a fist fight. And I think many of us believe that when we see those videos of Black Friday, and you ever see those people just getting in a brawl at the Walmart, right? It's like, man, that, just, that TV isn't worth it to me, right? We're ready to fight and battle for something that's going to be in the junkyard where friends will be outdated very soon. Everybody fighting for the latest iPhone, and I'm like, guys, you know, like next week they'll have another one, right? And yours will be outdated, right? Are we willing to fight for it? If so, friends, we're probably coveting it. Let me ask you fifth and finally, are you protective of keeping it safe? And I'll, I'll, I'll show you what this means here in a second. But if you're willing to fight for it, consider what you'll do to keep it, right? Are you protected of keeping it safe? And here's what I'm, here's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about I parked the car in the garage during a hailstorm. That's called good stewardship. But friends, if you're willing to let your family and the house go, but you keep the car, you might have some wrong priorities, right? Friends, if you're willing to over, if you're overprotective of it, friends, we do not want to lose our souls in order to keep our stuff. Jesus encountered a rich young ruler. You may have heard this passage. It's very famous, right? And he comes to the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler says, Jesus, I have kept every single one of the commands. And he lists them off. And then Jesus says, well, hey, you got a lot of stuff. You need to sell that and give it to the poor. Jesus wasn't teaching, hey, rich young ruler, you've got to work your way to heaven. But rather, Jesus recognized that this man with a lot of stuff, it was really his stuff that had a lot of him, right? And Jesus says, hey, you need to give up your stuff in order to save your soul. And we read these heartbreaking words as this man hears Jesus' message. The man says this, disheartened by the saying, he went Away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This man would rather have kept his stuff than had God. And before we were too critical of him, ask yourself this. The Bible talks about us getting mansions in heaven, and I, and I think that might be some, some symbolism that's there. But let's just say you do actually get a house. If you get a mansion in heaven, do you hope all of your stuff is still in it? We don't want to live in somebody else's house. That'd be weird, right? Would, it, would you be okay with streets of gold? Perfect health. Imagine this. Streets of gold. Perfect health. Peace of mind. No sorrow. No need. And you have everything you need. And as you imagine that, is there anything missing? Because, friends, here's the point. If we're, would we be fine with heaven if God wasn't there? <laughs> That may seem foolish to us, but friends, the rich young ruler exchanges the creator for the created, and friends, we do the same as well. We sell out the giver for the gift. And are we so protective of our stuff we would trade heaven in order to keep it? To drag our stuff to heaven with us, but us not be there? Friends, our hearts have a problem. Because ultimately, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart, right? We often covet and don't even realize it. And that's why the law is not useful to save us. If you continue reading in Exodus 20, you'll see how the people saw thunder, flashes of lightning, the mountain was smoking, and the people trembled and stood far off because the law could never ascend them into the presence of God could only condemn. It was useless to save. We are in a lot of trouble when we look at the Ten Commandments because every single one of us, the preacher included, has broken every single one. And the Ten Commandments shows us even if we haven't physically committed those things, we've desired them. And that's part of the problem. But I have good news for us. God has answers to our covetous desires. In fact, I want to offer you four answers to our covetous hearts and our covetous desires. Let me have us look at these four things as we, as we begin to land the plane together. Here's the first thing we got to do. You have to admit 
you can't change your own heart. You have to admit you can't change your heart. you got to realize what a mess we're in. We simply cannot change our hearts. You can't wake up one day and just bootstrap yourself into better desires. And we certainly do need to be careful, friends. Don't just follow every whim your heart has. That's a dangerous and fleeting thing. What we need is a new heart. A heart given by God. A heart with the law, with the law written on it, rather than being written on stone. Because a law on stone condemns us. A law within us empowers us. And God actually promises to give us a new heart. And he does it through a prophet named Ezekiel. And he says this. And I, God, will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Did you know that the battle with your sinful heart does not have to be a losing battle? But here's the problem. You can't obey the law written on stone with a heart made of stone. No, 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 no. You need a new heart. You need the Spirit of God within you to empower you from beginning to end. The hope isn't conformity to a moral code. It's transformation by the lawgiver. And the promise of Jesus is the promise to give you a new heart. To put the law within you. To enable you to live a new life. To not have your desires erased, but turned in the right direction. Jesus describes this in a simple phrase. To be born again. That's what Jesus describes. To be born again and have you experienced a new life in the Spirit. Have you been born again and given new life and being brought from having a heart of stone to a heart of flesh? Because, friends, if not, the good news is while this is a work of God, God promises to use his word and prayer to accomplish it for all who should seek it. If you were burdened by the weight of your sinful heart, God says, give it to me. I can bear it and I can give you a new heart and a new life. But you have to admit you can't do it on your own. You have to admit you can't change your own heart. You've got to give it to God and ask God to give you this new heart. And friends, if God has given you a new heart, that doesn't mean you're never going to struggle again. You're never going to be tempted again. You're never going to be trying to drawn away by the love of this world. That's why you got to do the second thing. You've got to ask God for help. It's an ongoing thing. You admit you can't do it yourself, and you ask God for help, because God is the one who gives us a new heart, and we've got to come to God when temptation comes. And as we're tempted to desire the wrong things or to desire in the wrong way, we've got to go, Father, help me. We've got to ask him to conform my heart to your word, to give me your desires and not mine. Did you know the Bible actually says God will give you the desires of your heart? Have you ever heard somebody tell you that? Well, there's a little more to the verse. Let me show you the verse here. Psalm 37, 4 says this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So follow me here. As we pray... And if we delight in God's word and study it and pursue God, our desires are changed and conform to his. So that when he gives us what we desire, he's actually giving us also what he desires. Because here's the thing. Prayer, most of the time, is about changing us before it's about changing circumstances. Prayer almost always changes us. And if we stop and pray, we've got to plead with God and cling to his word. And here's one of the most frustrating things. People say, well, pastor, I prayed. I prayed that God would keep me off, off of my phone a little less. It's like, no, no, no. Sometimes we've got to pray and we've got to get away from the situation, from the temptation. Jesus says, you've got to be willing to do more and leave it. And pray. And friends, we got to have fighter verses. Do you have fighter verses? Do you have 
promises from God, verses from the Bible that are sort of swords that you pull out to do war with your own heart when, they, when you're lured away from God. Because friends, if you don't have a few of those, you're going into war without a sword. And that's a scary place to be, right? We need to know, memorize, internalize, pray, meditate on God's word when temptation comes. Let me give you a few swords that are on my side. Here's Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. When I'm tempted to find pleasures in the wrong things, friends, I revert myself. He has made known to me the path of life. The way of God is the way to life, and in his presence is better joy than anything fleeting this world has to offer. Or I remind myself of Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, that says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What a motivator to be pure, to realize, he says, oh, I'm blessed when I'm pure, because when one day I'm going to see God, and be in his presence, and friend, seeing God is far better than seeing whatever you might find on a computer screen. Or think about this from Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Keep your life free from the love of money to be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What a promise to hear. I don't have to pursue the love of money because God promises he's never going to leave. Your bank account may have nothing, but you've got God. And he's not going anywhere. We've got to be willing to ask God for help and, and be rooted in his word and pray. And we've got a third, abide in God as the source of your joy. Friends, we've got to abide in God, delight ourselves in the Lord. Recognize, friends, for all eternity, you're not going to have a car, you're not going to have your house, you're not going to have your stuff. But you're going to have God, and He will be enough. And you don't got to wait till heaven to enjoy that contentment now. Friends, that's a reality you can experience in the present. Because if you desire God things, you will find God to be better than all things. Or Jesus puts it this way. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You ever just felt satisfied? You ever tasted and seen that the Lord is good? He says, seek me and find me. Then go find out. And then finally, we acknowledge the gifts of God. We acknowledge the gifts of God. Because friends, at its root, covetousness is fought with thanksgiving. It's really hard to desire more if you're thankful for what you have. One of the things I do to fight covetousness in my own life is, friends, we will stop and pray for a meal before we eat. And that's not some empty ritual in order for everybody in the restaurant to look. That guy must be a Christian. No, no, no. It's to help me realize that everything I'm given, God has given to me. And it's a means of warring against covetousness in my own heart. It's not supposed to be some empty, I repeat some words and they're empty, but no, they're meant to actually fill my heart. And we're meant to be thankful for God's greatest gift. The gift of his son. The gift of Jesus. Friends, because of Jesus' death on the cross in our place and his victorious resurrection from the dead, we can be born again and experience new desires and new life. Friends, if you've not been born again, you can be. And again, it's not about simply following all the rules and doing better. No, it's about life transformation from the King of Heaven. And if you've never experienced that today, you can. Because of Jesus' ascension into Heaven and His perfect role as High Priest, we're able to come to Him because He sympathizes with us and is able to give us grace and mercy in our time of need to stand firm in temptation. And because of Jesus' work on our behalf, by grace through faith, we have access to the source of our soul's eternal satisfaction, to God himself. And the Bible tells us eternal life actually begins the moment you believe. You don't have to wait for it. You can enjoy it now by faith. 
praise through the gospel, by the Spirit, with the Word. We have everything we need in order to win the war with covetousness. We have everything we need to have our sins forgiven, to be given new life and new desires. Not a, a sinlessness, but a new direction. Friends, if you're in need of new direction, Jesus stands ready to receive you. And God has given his people, those of us who are trusting in him, who are following him, who have been born again, who are indwelt and empowered by the Spirit, God's given us another gift to fight the battle for new desires. It's called the Lord's Supper. Did you know that the Lord's Supper is meant to call our minds toward higher things? As often as we take it, it sets our priorities anew. Our hearts are pointed to Jesus. Through the bread and the juice, our minds and our hearts are reminded, and we taste the fresh of the glories of the gospel. We get a picture form of what God has spoken in his word. The Son of God has broken his body and spilled his blood to redeem and transform a people for himself. And today, if you're not a follower of Jesus, when the, the Lord's Supper is actually not here to be a meal that you've partaken, but something you observe, a second sermon that you look at and that you can understand and that you can hear and be pointed toward the eternal hope of the gospel. <clears throat> But for baptized believers, for followers of Jesus, the table stands open as a second word of hope. So friends, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, may it conform us more into the image of Jesus. Friends, let's prepare our hearts and pray. Father in heaven, we come to you now asking you to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. We're thankful that your word promises that you'll give those who trust in you a new heart, that you'll give us new desires, that you'll enable us to know you and love you. And Lord, I pray you would give us hearts that are not covetous for more things, but that long for you and long to live for you. And Lord, I pray right now that if anyone here has not been born again, that your spirit would cause them to be born again. And as we take the supper, those who are not followers of you would use it as a time to observe, to let the plate pass, and to just observe and to think on the symbolism of your broken body and shed blood. But for those of us who are followers of you, that it would renew our hope and renew our confidence in you as our Lord and Savior. And we ask and we pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.